I'm recording. <clears throat> so welcome everyone to the groundbreaking Battle Free Divorce Summit. I'm your host, Kiri Maponya. And for those who are meeting me for the, for the very first time, I'm also a divorce coach and the creator of the Battle Free Divorce Coaching System. And today is day one. I am so excited, as you can see, today's day one, and this is what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna be looking at the two things, the legal process and money, your finances. And the goal is to help demystify the legal process and your money, but also dispel some myths and misconceptions around the process, how the process works. So that way you can know what you need to know and be better prepared for the process. And in this segment in particular, we're gonna be looking at the legal side of things. And I have with me here an incredible attorney, my, and a dear friend, Mr. Chaim Steinberger. And he's gonna be helping us really understand the legal process and also how decisions are made. So welcome Chaim, and I'm so happy to have you here today. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you, Kiri, and it's a great honor that you chose me for your inaugural uh, session, and I thank you for that. I'm very honored. Yes, absolutely. Yes, so, me and you have had, you know, interesting conversations and I knew I had to have you here because of really your perspective and the way you approach this whole issue of helping people really navigate this chapter of their lives. So I, I'm so glad and honored that you're here to help us through that process. Um, so I thought before we get started, I, you know, I see you wear too many hats, right? So in addition to being a family and divorce attorney, you're also a mediator, you're also a negotiator. So I thought maybe take a moment to just tell our listeners a little bit about you, give them a background so they can see how all these different heads match or convene together. <laughs> so I went to law school later in life. I grew up in a very insular religious community. So my, my childhood and my teenage years was all studying religious texts and studying Talmudic law. And it wasn't until later in life that there was some instability. I was selling computer systems. I studied sales and marketing. And there was some instability with the computer manufacturer I was representing. I didn't feel comfortable to go out there and ask people to invest in a $75,000 computer system if it wasn't going to be around long term. And so I would have had to retool. And somebody brought to my attention that I can go to law school. And so I went to law school. I did rather well in law school. I graduated uh, eighth in my class of about 440. Wow. And I then worked at some of the largest law firms in the country. I started off at Schulte, Roth, and Zabel, a very prestigious firm in New York City. I then clerked for a federal judge. As you know, federal judges are appointed by the President of the United States mm -hmm. with the advice and consent of the Senate. So I had the unique opportunity to be in chambers. Mm -hmm to be behind the Iron Curtain right. and to help a judge write his decisions mm -hmm. and a smart judge and a caring judge. And I remember one case in particular where the, I would have thought that it was for sure the judge would rule one way and the judge ruled a completely different way. And I had the unique opportunity to look at the judge and say, judge, why do you rule that way? And he explained to me his reasoning. And so I got insight into a very smart, very caring judge and how they rule. Mm. After I clerked for the judge, I then went to work for Morgan Lewis and Bacchius. Morgan Lewis is the fourth largest law firm in the country. Mm -hmm. And during this period of time, I went through my own rather nasty divorce. In about 20 years, only one person has ever beat me in having a nastier divorce than mine. And I said to myself, there's got to be a better way. So I dedicated my life to practicing. I was always interested in negotiation, in mediation in law school, I took mediation classes. I became trained as a mediator. I worked first at the Queens Mediation Center, then at the Brooklyn Mediation Center. And it, doing mediation really is God's work because I've had people come to me, not necessarily in the divorce context, but also in the divorce context. People have been fighting three, four, five years. They've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. And in four hours, they're shaking hands and, walk, and, and, and walking out. Mm. And, and it's, it's amazing. You go, how can that be? Right, right. And the essence of that is, and, and stop me, I'm not sure. No, 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 I'm, I'm just, we're just having a conversation. But if I, if I veer, if you want to take the conversation elsewhere, I'm happy to go along with you. No, that's good what you're saying. So go on. But, yeah. 
here, here's a truism of all of us humans. Mm -hmm. The more threatened we are, the more uptight we become, the more rigid, the more inflexible. The more our visions narrow, we think that there's only one choice. We have to do this. I need this. I need this. I need this. I'm going to die if I don't get this. Right. Whether it's physical death, financial death, emotional death, we need to protect our children. We need to protect our loved ones. We need to protect our integrity. Right. We need to protect our identity. If something threatens our identity, we feel threatened. You may know this from your work, Kiri, mm -hmm. that... For a man, losing a job can be more traumatic than getting divorced mm -hmm. because men typically wrap their identity in the work they do. What's the first question you ask somebody at a, at a cocktail party? What's your name? What do you do? Right. Right. And so our identities, for men particularly, the identity is, is wrapped up in the job. If a man gets laid off, he can become depressed and anxious. He can withdraw. He feels like his whole life ceases to have meaning. Um, right. Women often, mostly, wrap up their identity in relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for a woman, relationships might be more important right. than what they do. And, right. and, and, and so if you take a woman who is a wife and a mother and you threaten her wifedom and her motherhood, she can feel an existential crisis. She can, like, I will cease to exist. That's a fate worse than death. Mm. And... Right. When we feel threatened, right. our focus becomes narrow. We only see few options instead of more options. The magic that happens in the mediation room mm -hmm. is that we take a deep breath. We give each party a feeling of safety and comfort. Right. We start to reestablish trust. And now we can start to think, okay, you need this. Well, why do you need this? And, and work out. And the, Okay, I understand, Mrs. Smith, the house is important to you. Why is the house so important to you? Well, little Jimmy has ADHD and the school has a great program. Okay, so it's not the house, it's a school district. Well, maybe now we can find a solution for it. So it, it's giving people the safety and comfort where they can now expand their vision and see different options. But we can't do that when we're feeling threatened. And so the greatest gift I can give my clients is to make them feel safe Mm -hmm. The greatest gift I can give the other side is to let them know I'm a tough negotiator. My clients do really well. They come out better. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say, I, I know you read my article, Divorce Without Destruction, a few months ago in the New York Law Journal. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I urge people to mediate or to use the better negotiation tactics, not because, okay, walk away with less, but don't make trouble. No, no. By using sophisticated negotiation techniques, you end up with more. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you get more money and you and you have a better working relationship because right. even if you get divorced, even if little Jimmy is 10 years old, child support in New York goes to 21, mm -hmm. but Thanksgivings go all the way up. Right. So Jimmy can be 35 years old and he goes, Thanksgiving is coming. Do I go to mom? Do I go to dad? They schedule the dinners at the same exact time. Mom gets angry if I go to dad. Dad gets angry if I'm going to mom. He's sitting there with his girlfriend and he's like, I don't know what to do. Right. And so what I'm suggesting is that if we can find a way to not further traumatize a relationship, look, we, we can get divorced. I, I don't have to be, I can recognize that my ex-wife is a wonderful, intelligent, caring, industrious woman. She wasn't right for me. I wasn't right for her. I don't have to be angry at her. Mm -hmm. And so, if we can find a way to work on this and to be able to work together in the future for the benefit of our children, then you're giving your children the biggest gift. If you truly love your children mm -hmm. as much as you say you do, mm -hmm. you will give your children the gift of allowing them to love the other parent as well. Mm -hmm. And if we can set things up in such a way that we're not competing, but we're working collaboratively, maybe, I don't know if, if, if you know, if, if the listener listening to us talk, I don't know if the listener is ever going to be able to go to the, their ex's Thanksgiving dinner. I know of many exes where they invite the ex for Thanksgiving. Right. And that's beautiful. That's wonderful. But even if not, maybe one parent makes it Thanksgiving Eve and the other one makes it Thanksgiving noon. And right. now the, the child can go to both. There are ways of working it out if we don't have to be adversarial. Mm, okay. 
Wow, that, that was an interest. That was a very. That was a lot in that intro. And I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I I, I talked too much. In a in a good way because it I sort of I think it leads beautifully into my next question, right? Because in because divorce generally is so adversarial, right? The the, the reason you mentioned we feel threatened, so there's a need for us to defend ourselves against you know the perceived danger or enemy, right? And so, but then the issue is then we take that to court with us. Isn't what happens and we bring that into the legal system and then we are surprised when things don't go the way we, we thought they would go. And so I guess that's what I want to ask you. Like, so how should we understand, in the context of everything else you have said, how should we understand the legal system to be or how it works? How can I understand? The legal process, right? Because okay. right, in the context of everything else, so like we could bring you all our fears and everything else into it and then we are surprised at how things turn out. So. The key is we're not understanding something about how the legal system works, how the process works. So can you help us understand that? Okay, happy to hear. So the the first thing to understand is that maybe the le so we have the best legal system in the world, mm -hmm. and there are those of us who work. I belong on a bunch of bar commit bar association committees with judges and lawyers, and we're constantly striving to improve the system. Mm -hmm. And it's the best system ever developed. We try to make it fair. We try to make it reasonable. We try to make it that everybody gets a fair hearing and that the people, the litigants, get a fair result. Mm -hmm. Having said that, between me and you, walking into a formal courtroom and standing in front of a judge wearing a black robe who doesn't know you, doesn't know your spouse, doesn't know your children, mm -hmm. that's probably not the best way to resolve personal disputes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's the only way we have. If you don't pick mm -hmm. one of the voluntary other ways, mm -hmm. then you're left to the formal legal system. Mm -hmm. and, and the legal system has to put in protections for people. And so everybody has to go through the funnel and, and, and get to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I just want to mention, so to me, the best system for people getting divorced is something called collaborative law. It's a variation off of mediation, but I, I, I but it's mediation with protection because every party has a lawyer at their side and then we mediate. And, and the reason I say that it's a more humane system, we sit across the table mm -hmm. and we negotiate like two human beings who have people that they love in common. Mm -hmm. And I, I forgive me, I know I'm backing up a little bit. This wasn't a direct question, but it's going to lead into it, I hope. Okay. <laughs> is that when people get to us, mm -hmm. they're feeling hurt, they're usually feeling angry, they're feeling aggrieved. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and, and that really doesn't make sense. And, and, and okay, uh, can I have another? To, to, I know I'm, I'm, I'm veering off, but, but this, this forms the basis of everything that I do. Are you familiar with the story of the scorpion and the frog? The scorpion and the frog? No. One. So, uh -huh. this frog is on the side of a river, uh -huh. and the scorpion comes over to him and says, Excuse me, Mr. Frog, it's really important. I need to get to the other side of the river. Would you please give me a ride across the river? Okay. And the frog goes, No, of course not. You're going to sting me, and then I'm going to sink and die. And the scorpion goes, oh. If I sting you, you're going to sink and die, but then I'll die too. Uh -huh. And the frog goes, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, hop aboard. And the frog is halfway across the river. He's swimming along, and he feels a sting. And he goes, what do you do that for? Now we're both going to sink and die. And the scorpion goes, I know, but I'm a scorpion. I got to do what I do, huh? I got to be me. <laughs> what I do. Yeah, what I do. And so... Each of us, mm -hmm. each of us, we are the product of our childhoods, of our parents, of our childhood wounds, of the values our parents instilled in us. Mm -hmm. So you've probably heard the expression, women marry their fathers and men marry their mothers. And that's because if your father fixed cars, when you see a man who says, I don't know how to fix cars, you just don't respect them the same way as when a man fixes cars. Right. right. So... We, we have the values subliminally, mm -hmm. and we bring that along. And very often, 
there are a number of reasons that people get divorced, and that's fine. I tell people you get one merry-go-round ticket. You may as well make it count. If there's, if you're in a relationship, do everything you can do to make it the best, fantastic relationship you can. But if there's no way, no how, round peg, square hole, it's not going to fit. Right. It, it took me many years to realize my wife was never going to respect me. The qualities that I brought to the table were not qualities she valued. Mm. And the things she valued were not qualities I would want to exhibit. Mm. Mm. I love the, the saying of Winston Churchill said about somebody he disliked. He said, he has all of the virtues I despise mm. and none of the vices I admire. Wow. Right? And we all know people like that, the goody two shoes, but you can't stand them. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. All of the virtues I despise and none of the vices I admire. Yeah. Okay. So when clients come in here and they're brimming with anger and they're brimming with, with, with revenge and justice, it doesn't make sense. We don't, you don't. Somebody came to me on a, on, a, on a consult the other day, and she's like, should I worry about this? And I said, no. And she goes, why not? And I said, have you done everything you can to get a good result? She goes, yes. I said, then why worry? Worrying, if there's something more you can do, do everything you can possibly do, but once you've done everything you can, worrying doesn't help you. Right. And so in this context, if you decide to divorce your spouse, if your spouse could never be the person that makes your heart sing, that makes you walk on rainbows every day, you, you and every one of us are entitled to find a person that makes our heart sing. That's a different lecture, love and true love, and it, it really does exist. Mm -hmm. And too many people say, well, I don't really believe in true love. It's a figment, it's Hollywood. No, it really does exist. Different lecture will do that. But I'm entitled to that. Kiri, you're entitled to that. Every one of our listeners is entitled to finding true love. If you can do something to make the relationship you're in become a really great relationship, do everything you can to make it a great relationship. But if no way, no how. Mm -hmm. If you can't because they're just a different type of person mm -hmm. and they don't get you, mm -hmm. then, then you can get divorced. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to be vindictive. You don't have to hurt them back. You can just say, thank you for so many years that we spent together. I honor and respect the time we had. It's time for me to move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Because being angry, who said this about holding a grudge? Holding a grudge against somebody is like drinking poison mm -hmm. and expecting the other person to die. Right. We hold on to a grudge. We shut down a part of our heart mm -hmm. and we hurt ourselves. Mm -hmm. So... If I can help my clients get over the anger, let's be strategic about it. Let's figure out how to set up our divorce so that you come out ahead. Mm -hmm. But why be angry? The anger won't help you in the system. In fact, a witness on the witness stand, if the witness gets up very angry, they lose their credibility. If a witness, so let me give you another example. When two parents are fighting over the children and the judge doesn't know what to do, very often the judge will send them out for a forensic evaluation. Right. And forensic evaluations are a pain. The forensic evaluator will see dad with the children, mom with the children, the children alone, the children with dad, mom and dad maybe with the children, and see them all, see them together, see them separately, and what do you do? And, and then write up a long report. And that has, that's like a thumb on the scales within the, divorce process. Whoever the forensic evaluator favors sort of has an easier time, even though by law, technically, the forensic evaluator should not make the decision which parent. Some judges, there were decisions way back where the judge got really angry, like, we paid all this money, you didn't even tell me who to give custody to. Well, who should get custody really should be a decision for the judge, not for the forensic evaluator. Forensic evaluator is not a judge. They don't have the constitutional power to make those decisions. But it often happens. There's a blurring of the line. Mm -hmm. But the point that I was driving at, and forgive me, I seem to be going off ta on tangents. The point I was trying to make is that when a forensic evaluator calls you in and says, so tell me something good about your spouse, and you have nothing good to say about a person you chose to marry, you chose to sire your children, 
-hmm. and you can't think of a single good thing to say, that means you're not, mm. you're, you're in the throes of emotion. Yeah, yeah. And it ruins, it, it diminishes your credibility. The better angle, when I prepare my clients, and there's a whole long discussion about what is appropriate preparing of clients and what is inappropriate preparing of clients. So I can't tell a client, when he asks you this, say this. When he asks you that, say that. But it, it would be my, I would be committing malpractice if I didn't tell my client what is the significance of the evaluation, what is the evaluator looking for, how to be a better parent. Mm -hmm. So if I'm representing a man who was abusive, angry, and alcoholic, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell him to just go in and be abusive, alcoholic, and, and angry, and alcoholic. I am going to send them to... AA meetings, and I'm going to send them to anger management meetings. And then when I get up in court, I say, Your Honor, this is a new man standing before you. And we try to, but but I'm not trying to fool the system because that would be playing out of bounds. Right. I'm trying to help my client become a better parent so that I can get up, my client can hold his or her head up high mm -hmm. and be that better parent, and I can now represent my client is a better parent to the court. So the better way to come into court, to go to forensic evaluator, is to be even keel, to say, well, my spouse, they've got good, good parts to them, and they've got some bad attributes. Here's why I would be the better parent. Mm -hmm. So to go back, the, the big, the biggest misconception that I find non-lawyers and maybe even baby lawyers, rookie mistakes, or as I call baby lawyers, lawyerlings make, is that they think the law is like arithmetic. Mm -hmm. Somebody can pipe up and go, two plus two, your honor, and the judge goes, well, four, of course. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite that way. Okay. And the I've had, I've had people come to me say, Chaim, you're a great lawyer. You're expensive. Why don't you come up with one of your great litigation strategies? And then I've got this kid who just graduated law school, and, and I can pay him a couple of bucks, and he'll get up and do it. And the problem is that if you don't know to effectuate it. So I've been collecting. I know it sounds like I'm, 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 I'm rambling, but it's all sort of connected. Okay. So for the last 20 years, I've been collecting best books. The okay. best book I found on trial practice was written by the late Judge Ralph Adam Fine called The How to Win Trial Manual. And he's, he argues that the most important quality of a lawyer, if Kerry, if you needed a lawyer for something, you said, Chaim, what's the most important thing I can, I can look for in a lawyer? It would be that the lawyer truly believes in your case, that their heart is in it, that they get the justice of your position and that they can get up and present it. So if the lawyer doesn't get the case, if the lawyer thinks, oh, you just get up and say, one of the hardest, and this is a sophisticated concept, so I'm a little bit frustrated trying to take a, a long concept and put it into short words, but I'll, I'll try, hopefully I'll, um, I'll do it justice. There's something called the theory of the case. Okay. And that's sort of the story. A short, maybe one line story. So if two people are fighting over a contract, maybe a theory of the case would be honor your commitments. Mm -hmm. They signed the contract. They're not, they're not honoring their commitments. Right, right, or right. a negligence case. Take responsibility for your mistakes. The doctor made a mistake. He's not a bad person. He made a mistake. He should now make it right. He should pay for the mistake he made. Mm -hmm. Somebody, a car accident, doesn't mean the person's a bad person. But right. if, I, if I injure somebody else, I should make it right. right. Mm -hmm. And so, in the sophisticated world, mm -hmm. generally speaking, each side has a theory of the case. And developing a theory of the case that encompasses what's important to you and presents it, and all of the critical evidence has to be consonant with the theory of the case. So if there's one 
if I'm arguing that my parent is a better parent mm -hmm. and there's a story where the parent was hanging out with friends and they left the child four hours standing outside the school in the rain because they forgot to pick him up. Mm -hmm. That's a problem because that destroys that one fact wow. can destroy your entire theory of the case. Huh. So what I'm suggesting is that rather than nuts and bolts of lawyering and thing, that that's sort of the picture and the justice of the case. I've had people come in here and they 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 tell me a story after 15, 20 minutes. I said, let me let me see if I understand and I'll repeat back their story with a little bit of, of, of I don't want to say spin, but the way I heard it. And I've had a woman tell me, wow, I can't believe this. I've been I've been cogitating over this for three years, and in 15 minutes you said it better than I ever could have. Right. And so I would argue that is the single most important thing mm -hmm. in a case. What are we fighting about? Why is this a fight when the judge looks at the first meeting and says, okay, what's going on? Why hasn't this settled? Right. And to find the justice in my party suit. So I may have a law that says I win. Mm -hmm. That won't be enough. I need to win over the judge's heart, mind, body, and soul so that the judge will feel that if my client doesn't get what I'm arguing my client should get, mm -hmm. that a great injustice will be done or that the children will be harmed. And so I can talk to you about technicalities and statutes and rules and subdivisions. Mm -hmm. But this, when somebody comes to me and, and they have to go out and do some work on themselves by themselves, I would say, hey, I, I've said this on a number of occasions to clients, that if you think the issue through and you use your common sense, mm -hmm. you will probably come pretty close to where the law is at, unless you don't know that there's an argument on the other side. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but if you know all of the elements, if, if I were to walk up to you and say, okay, if I made you a judge tomorrow and you had two parents fighting over the children, what would you use to decide which parent gets it? Yeah. I, I imagine, Kiri, you would say, well, I take a look to see what's better for the children. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so to put it to legal words, that's the best interest of the children. Mm -hmm. and, and now what is best interest of the children? Well, the answer is pretty much everything. Yeah. And, and that's a long discussion and we can have that. Mm -hmm. But on so many things, so until 1980 in New York State, mm -hmm. whoever property was titled to owned the property. So in 1979, if two people got divorced, and back in the days of our parents and grandparents, mm -hmm. the houses were titled in dad's name alone, the bank accounts were in dad's name alone, dad had the credit cards, and he gave mom a credit card, but it was in his name, she had nothing. Mm -hmm. And so until 1980, New York State was a title state where everything belonged to the person who owned it. And then... When, when they got divorced, dad had to pay mom alimony until she found a new sucker, I mean husband, to take care of her, okay? Mm -hmm. In 1980, the New York State Legislature recognized that a marriage is not only a physical and emotional partnership, but it's also an economic partnership. Mm -hmm. And so when husband, when hubby is working for 40 years and he builds up a $3 million pension and it's all in his name, the wife owns a piece of that pension mm -hmm. was when she made lunches and she made him a bag lunch and kissed him on the cheek and say, had a nice day there. And she took care of little Jimmy who was sick in bed and he didn't have to take off from work. Mm -hmm. She was contributing to his pension. Mm -hmm. And so everything they earned during the marriage belongs to the both of them. Mm -hmm. And that feels sort of right in today's day and age, right? We don't, I, I, I imagine Carrie, you don't have a problem with that. No. And so, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so, if you understand that now in New York, it doesn't say equal distribution; it says equitable distribution. Okay. So we take a look at fairness. But the the law, the, the case law says that in a long term marriage, I'm sorry, state of affairs in, in today's day and age, of anything over seven, eight, nine, ten years is considered a long term marriage. Okay. How can we ever imagine people stay together that long? Okay, lifespans are increasing. 200 years ago, people didn't live to 80, 90 years old. Mm -hmm. So maybe, but, but nevertheless, um, 
if if you understand, so there's a presumption in the law that in a long term marriage, it would be a fifty fifty split. The split. But 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 it's equitable, so the judge can can vary a little bit. So now we have to make an argument. Okay, why should we vary here? So of course, if the woman is out the entire marriage and she's working, and the husband is sitting home popping beers and watching cartoons all day, maybe he shouldn't get one half of everything she earned during the marriage. But that's an argument to be made. So so the sort of the the the, the to, to answer your question succinctly. Mm -hmm. I would argue that if you apply common sense, if you know, forgive me, this brings me to another topic. I, that everything in the law is always a seesaw. And so you always have to know what's on the other side of a seesaw. When little Jimmy wants to go out and play in the park, he goes, I'm going to play on the seesaw, Dad. I'm like, okay, but who's on the other side? Because if he's got a 900 pound gorilla on the other side, he's not going to have any fun. And if he's got, you know, wispy feather, he's not going to have fun either. So you need to know what's on the other side. So every time you get a case, every time I get a, any litigator gets a case, you're thinking about the other side. What's on the other side of the seesaw and how do we balance? And so if you, if you understand that and you apply common sense and logic, mm -hmm. eight times out of 10, you'll come pretty close. I would say if you're in tune with the mores of society, you'd come pretty close to where we're at. And and I would argue that that's more important than the technicalities of it. And that when you said, what does the law work? And some people think, well, I'll, I'll go out on the internet. I, I call it the, um, uh, the curse of the, the curse of Google, where people think that you go out and you do a quick Google search and okay, I know everything about a lawyer. I just had somebody here who thought they could do everything i'm like fine i'll serve as your coach you do it and then after three months of trying really hard to work on it the person told me this is too hard you've got to do this but it took them three months to figure out that they don't have the skill that right. google searches don't tell you what you need to know so my point being the practice of law is not arithmetic mm -hmm. it's as much an emotional argument as it is a technical argument you can't do emotion without technical but you can't do technical without the emotional argument either. It has to be rooted in justice and fairness and righteousness. And then supported by the technical law. Mm -hmm. That is a mouthful. <laughs> and I see why they need an attorney. <laughs> because I wouldn't know where to start with all of that. <laughs> and so this is how the judges look at it is that what you're saying this is how the judges look at how they're going to make decisions in terms of who gets what so they i'm i'm, I'm being a bit more general mm -hmm. uh, i'm being a, a a bit more broad brush a big picture overview right I, I don't know that if you found a judge they would tell it to you this way i'm, mm -hmm. I'm saying sophisticated writers mm -hmm. and sophisticated legal analysts like judge fine will tell you that every argument you make has to be rooted in justice because otherwise the judge is the judge isn't doesn't feel compelled to rule in your favor having been in chambers and getting arguments from two briefs they go the, the law must mean this the law must mean that and you're like oh um, it couldn't mean either one i see it both mm -hmm. so do you, may I run something on you? Okay, okay this is, uh, I'm forgetting the author of the book that had this. This is from my first year of law school. A town has a problem. Mm -hmm. They have vi vagrants sleeping in the park at night. People, the townsfolk are, are scared to allow their children mm -hmm. to walk past the park. Mm -hmm. And so the town passes an ordinance, no sleeping in the park. Anybody caught sleeping in the park will pay a $50 fine or spend the night in jail. Mm -hmm. Sounds good? Sounds good. Any problem? Nope. <laughs> you are the judge. Mm -hmm. The day after the ordinance goes into effect, the policeman walk in with two lawbreakers. The first lawbreaker is a hobo. Mm -hmm. He's got patches all over his clothing. He's got the stick with the little hobo thing that he's walking with. And you go, what's your story? And the man goes, well, it was 12 midnight, 
I was lying on the park bench. I was covered in a newspaper. I had a pillow under my head. I was trying to fall asleep, but I drank a cup of coffee an hour before, and the caffeine kept me awake. I couldn't fall asleep. Okay. That's the first lawbreaker. Uh -huh. The second lawbreaker, you look over to the second lawbreaker, and it's a distinguished gentleman with a top coat and a top hat, with a silk kerchief and the, and the, and the silk glo white gloves, and he's got his silver-topped walking stick. Mm -hmm. And you go, and what's your story, sir? And he goes, well, I was taking my afternoon constitutional. And as I strolled by the park, I realized I was a bit fatigued. So I sat down on the park bench. I folded my hands over my walking stick. And inadvertently, I fell asleep for 10 minutes. You are the judge, Kiri. Which one, if any, is innocent? Which one, if any, is, is guilty? I don't know. I would think they're both guilty because it says you can sleep in the park. <laughs> okay. The first one, the hobo was sleeping? Was he not sleeping? Oh, he was sitting. Well, okay. What does the law say? Does it say he can sleep in I the park? was sleeping in the park. That's all it says. Okay. So that's the, I mean, okay, it's a good attorney. I guess I'll get him off because he wasn't sleeping. He was You're sleeping. the judge. You're not the attorney. Oh. Oh, that's a tough one. Well, I guess the gentleman who was sleeping is the one who must be guilty then, if he was sleeping in the park. But then he was sitting on the bench. Does that constitute sleeping? I don't know. <laughs> so, the reason I love this story uh -huh. is there are people that say they're both guilty. There are people that say they're both innocent. Right. There are people that say the hobo is guilty and the gentleman is innocent. There are people that say the gentleman is guilty and the hobo is innocent. And this taps into the bigger questions like how literal does the law, how literally do we apply? Do we apply the words of the law? So there are people, and particularly in the religious communities, that say, well, the hobo wasn't sleeping, and the gentleman was sleeping, the gentleman is guilty, the hobo is innocent. And I go, you realize you just flipped the law on its head. The law wasn't intended to prevent gentlemen from walking by at noon, but it was intended to keep hobos from lying on the park bench at midnight. They're like, but the law is the law. The law is the law. I feel like Shakespeare, the Merchant of Venice. I want the law. The law is written. Mm -hmm. Without any heart, without mm -hmm. any emotional intelligence. The law, the law is it's written. And I know of a lot of lawyers. Mm -hmm. It's certainly whenever I judge or mentor or help uh, law school students, this is the best advice I can give them when they go, the law, the law, the law is it's written. Mm -hmm. And and there's a certain, as you know, on the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia, others, the, the sort of the literalists, we have to apply the Constitution as it's written. Right. They, mock, they mock the whole line of U.S. Supreme Court cases, uh, Griswold v. Connecticut. So up until 1970, was it? Don't hold me to this. I, the, okay. In 1970, mm -hmm. the, the, the Mrs. Griswold went into a, a pharmacy in Connecticut. She was married to buy condoms. And they prosecuted, or was Griswold the, or Griswold may have been the pharmacist. And they prosecuted, because it was illegal to sell um, birth, control. Uh -huh. birth control to married women. It was illegal. Mm -hmm. And the US Supreme Court decided, they said, you know what, it doesn't say in our constitution, thou shalt not sell birth control. But you know what? Our Constitution has a flavor of what people do in the privacy of their own homes is not the government's business. Right, right. And so they use the term the penumbra, sort of the, the emanations of, this, of the Constitution. We don't want government mucking about what you do with your boyfriend, what you do with your spouse in your bedroom. That's, that's no business. We don't have business. The whole, the, the, the misogynation laws and who you can, it's like, we shouldn't, and, and then of course the Roe v. Wade debate. And so the question of how literally do we, the, 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 of course the, the conservatives mock the Supreme Court, the penumbra, penumbra, like where in the, where in the, in the, in the constitution is there a penumbra? Is it there? But, but, there, but you can understand, wait, our constitution gives us a feeling that we live in a free society. A free society means we don't live in the Philippines where, where, where the president can go killing people on the street because he thinks they're drug dealers. It, that, that there's with a free society there's certain there are certain things that come along with it so the the point being 
that I would argue that putting the gentleman in jail and letting the hobo off, you flip the, the, the law on its head. You've applied the law in such a way that you're doing the exact opposite of what the law was intended to do. So good lawyers, again, now we're talking about sophisticated litigation. Good lawyers never talk at each other. They usually talk past each other. One lawyer argues the actual words of the statute. The other lawyer argues, no, no, the spirit of the statute. One lawyer argues justice in this case. The other lawyer argues justice for society. So when the police go in without a search warrant and they find the bloody knife in the defendant's home that killed the 16-year-old girl's neighbor, right? And they're like, Your Honor, are you going to let this murderer go free because we forgot to get a search warrant? And the, the defendant's lawyer doesn't say, yes, yes, let the murderer go free. The defendant's lawyer says, we need to protect society at large from the police running rampant and searching people's homes. And the only way to protect people from unreasonable search and seizures is to tell the police in advance, if you do it without a warrant, even if you find the most incriminating evidence, we're going to throw it out. So you better make sure you get a warrant before you go in there. And that's a protection for all of society. If it means that if one guilty person goes free, so be it. That's the price of society. So when I was talking earlier about the seesaw, mm -hmm. one argues justice in this case, one argues justice in society, one argues the letter of the law, the other argues spirit of the law. But can you see, Carrie, how maybe one judge will say they're both innocent because on a park bench 10 minutes isn't sleeping, and the other guy technically wasn't sleeping. I can see another judge say they're both guilty because you were sleeping 10 minutes and because he was lying on a park bench at 12 midnight with a pillow under his head, that's called sleeping, even though scientifically it's not sleeping. For the law, we will consider that sleeping, okay? So this idea that people think, let's say a judge issues an order and somebody goes and they know the judge didn't want them to do it and they violate it and they go, but you didn't say it this way and they think they're going to get away with it. Not always. Not always. So, so if people think that they can play the technicalities the way we did in religious law, the way we did, it, sometimes it works. Mm -hmm. but, but you need to know when and where and how it does it. So I would argue that the, the spirit of the law is just as important and that we need to pay attention to it because that's a driving force. And, and just to give you the technical terminology for it, we live in a civil law country. We live in a common law country, not a civil law country. The civil law countries, which is like France and Louisiana, because we bought Louisiana from France. So Louisiana is the only state in the union where you have civil law, where they're strictly bound to the exact letter of the law. So in Louisiana, I imagine they would say the hobo is innocent and the gentleman is guilty because he wasn't sleeping with that literal interpretation that you were referring to. But in a common law country, the judges have a bit more freedom. And the balance between, and the danger of more freedom means, does that mean judges can do whatever they want? Well, no, the law constrains them. They should follow the law, but they follow the law a little differently and they apply the law in such a way as to do justice and to make sense. And that balance is a difficult thing. Lots of, I think, I think Carl Llewellyn wrote a book called The Brum Bramble Bush on that issue. Uh, how do you, balance like how are they bound are they bound are they not bound and, and well i'm suggesting for the purposes of our conversation that it's not as clear cut it's not arithmetic it's not too close to his four any way you add it right left side no no here you can have saving victory from the jaws of defeat or or or, or defeat from the jaws of victory you can have a great case and one little fact pops up and if you don't know about it, it can flip the whole case over. Or, on the other hand, I can do this to the other side, where I can walk in on a complete loser of the case and win. I walked in on one. I'm going to show off a little bit. I, I had a case where a client had four prior lawyers, which is a huge alarm bell when somebody has four lawyers, something's going on. I walked in to ask for an adjournment. He was being charged with contempt of court. And I walked in and just said, Counselor, you know your client's got one foot in Rikers. I said, yes, Your Honor. He had been referred to a referee. Referee had already found him in contempt. The referee recommended that he be incarcerated. The referee's decision had gone up to the judge for confirmation. The judge had already said she was going to confirm the referee's report. It's like, it's, it's one of those, 
bring your toothbrush to the next court date thing. And I was like, Your Honor, I need a brief adjournment. Judge gave me four weeks. We came back in. We had a two hour oral argument in front of the judge, and I turned the judge's head around. And I walked out of that courtroom with the judge knowing that my client was the good guy and the other one was the bad was the, the, the bad guy. And then of course I had the technical arguments that the judge had to do what I had to do. Ooh, but it wasn't just the technical, it was the the emotional of it. Hmm. Because if, if the judge continued to believe that my guy was a bad guy, then she would have either at this thing or at the next one, the, the, my client would have gone away. Okay. So in, that's interesting. So in the context of divorce, so what you're saying is better to work these things out if you can in mediation, right? So in the context of divorce, like you have, you have so, a better chance of working the stuff out in mediation than having to do with all those technicalities and that happens in the court system. So, I'm a big believer in mediation, but if I were mediating a divorce case, I want each party to have a lawyer. Right. Because as a mediator, I can't protect you. So if you're coming in to get divorced, mm -hmm. and, and who was it? Somebody just called me about a story where, where the wife didn't have a lawyer and they, they get to the pension. And somebody says, well, he worked for the pension. It should be his. And she goes, well, I guess. I don't know. And if she doesn't know this fact that anything earned during the marriage by either party belongs to the both of us, then she doesn't know she may be giving up. I had a woman come in who was 61 and she's like, I'm a, I want to retire and I'll have no money. I will die of hunger. And I said, well, when you got divorced, didn't you get his pension, a piece of his pension? And she goes, no. I said, why not? She goes, well, we were at mediation. I'm like, who represented me? Oh, no, I didn't have a lawyer. And nobody warned her. The job of the mediator is not to protect her. The mediator's job is not to protect the people. The mediator's job is to facilitate the two of you come to a resolution. So when I am mediating, I want each party to have a lawyer. So if you're about to make a mistake, I want your lawyer to say, excuse me, Mr. Mediator, I need to speak to my client outside. I need to explain something to him. And then they'll go out and then the party comes back in and goes, well, no, I can't, or, or this is how, well, I'll walk away from the pension if you give me the house. And, 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 and we figure out how to do it fairly. But as a mediator, I can't protect you. Okay. And the moment I start telling you, oh, you want to walk away from the mediation, from the pension, you know that my lawyer entitled to half of the pension. The moment I say that, your spouse knows that I've left, I'm not neutral anymore. Now I'm trying to protect one side. So I've lost my credibility of being a mediator. So whenever I mediate, I beg, borrow, and plead with that the parties, bring the lawyers in here. It's too dangerous. If you have a million dollar dispute and you want to come in without lawyers and mediate, that's fine. You leave money on the table, you'll make it back. It doesn't matter. But a person's most critical, vital concerns are up for grabs in mediation. A woman's ability to be self-sufficient, I'll use it paradigm case, although I know today there are women who make more money than the men, but a woman's ability to be self-sufficient financially independent for the next 15, 20 years, for her to support herself and the children could be an issue. If it's not done right, she could have serious problems. A man's ability to have contact, ongoing, reliable presence in the children's lives could be, I had a man come in with a, with a divorce agreement, and I said, uh, and, 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 I reviewed the agreement and I said, excuse me, Mr. Smith, is Christmas a big deal for you? He goes, it's the holiest day of the Christian calendar. I'm like, okay, do you realize that under this proposed agreement, you will never ever have your children and your parents around your Christmas tree holding hands on Christmas Eve? And so it, it's, I'd rather the parties have a lawyer. So when earlier I sort of alluded to this, mm -hmm. to me, See, people make a mistake. They think, I, I'll hear this from people on the phone, otherwise they go, well, if we use lawyers, we have to pay for two lawyers. If we use mediators, we pay only one lawyer. Let's, let's pay one lawyer instead of two. And that's not the reason to use, don't use mediation to save money on legal fees. That's not why you do it. Mm -hmm. I, if we're mediating, I want to mediation-friendly lawyers, and some lawyers don't know 
how the mediation process is. They are um, inclined to be adversarial. They won't. They they'll, they'll resist the process. Mm -hmm. But any fair-minded lawyer who's good who knows their stuff. The worst thing you can do is have a bad lawyer. I tell my clients, the worst thing that can happen to you is your spouse have a bad lawyer. If you've got two good lawyers and they know what the law is, they can sit down and talk and they can negotiate. Mm -hmm. But if you have a bad lawyer who doesn't know what the law is now, they don't trust anything you say and now they, they blow it up. The reason to go to mediation is so that you don't further traumatize the relationship. Okay. And I prefer, my recommendation mm -hmm. is for mediation with protection. Mediation with protection means either you have two lawyers, the two parties with their, each with their lawyer and the mediator, and then the mediator keeps the temperatures cool and helps you search for different resolutions where you get wherever I get. Did I tell you the story of the orange? Uh, no, I read it. But you read it. Yeah, I read so it. I repeat it. <laughs> I read it about cutting the orange and the so other. Do you want yeah, go ahead. It's a funny story. It's a quick story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so two people fighting over an orange. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. Finally, one one of them becomes impatient, pulls out a knife, cuts the orange in half, walks away with this half of the orange, peels the orange, shows the way the peel and eats the fruit. The next guy takes his half of the orange, peels the orange, throws away the fruit, and uses the peel to bake a cake. And we go, if only somebody would have asked them, what do you want the orange for? You could have had the whole orange, you could have had, people don't realize this when they say mediation, how can I do it? We're fighting, how can we get, I'm like, the reason you can get more mediation is because you find different ways. Usually, when people come to us, they are diametrically opposed. I want it, I want it. And that's all they see. Mm -hmm. And we have to do a little bit of digging, and people have to open up a little bit. Well, why do you really want it? Mm -hmm. And, well, I really want the house because it has a great pool, and weekends I want to go swimming with the children. Well, how about the other party gets the house, but you can use it on weekends? Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you could start thinking of things and going back to your original question, judges can't do that. Judges can just award custody or not award custody or award money or not award money. or It, 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 it has to be in the terms of the law with the language when the parties are working together. Right. They, they can achieve more. They can accomplish what they really want, what's really important because mm -hmm. they're not constrained by the legalisms. And so if we sit down, it, look, you want to get divorced. You don't want to live with this person anymore. That's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Let's sit down and see if we can work out a way without anger, without bitterness. How do we get you to where you have to be so that you can have a happy rest of your life without yeah. fighting? And studies show, so two things I should say. Mm -hmm. Children, I know we're, we're running yeah. longer than we should. So yeah. th this is critical. Studies show that if parent, children will overcome, if parents who hate each other stay together, the children will get over it. Five years later, they'll be normal children. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Parents who get divorced, children will get over it. Five years later, you can't tell that their children are divorced. Mm -hmm. But if there's a long, drawn-out, nasty battle, the longer the battle, the nastier the battle, it will have a permanent effect on the children. This kid will now be 50 years old, and there will be something off with them. Mm -hmm. When you walk into a party, that's the person who doesn't quite find their place in the world. Yeah. And so it has a permanent effect on the people. And so what I'm advocating is that if we can find a way to create an, an, an aura of trust, a, a, mm -hmm. uh, a cooperation, collaboration. Of cooperation, let's get you what you want. Let's yeah. get you what's really important to you. Let's find you a way that you can move on with your life. And look, the other party is a scorpion. They have to do what they did. I, I can't be angry at my spouse for not doing ta, 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 ta. that. That just wasn't something. Right. Like I grew up studying the Talmudic books and the laws. Names was never important to me. I have a terrible time to this day remembering names. I meet some people come up to me and they're like, we met before. And I'm like, we did where? I'm like, I, did I sleep with you? No. Okay, I didn't sleep. But but I, I but I have trouble remembering names. And if you want to blame me for it, you know, I will accept I will accept the responsibility for it. But I I, I I I don't seem to have the control of that. You can blame me if you want, but it won't 
make either of us any happier. So if we can recognize mm -hmm. that, so for example, you just learned from the last hour that I talk too much. I can't help it. And so, you, you know, you either accept it or you don't. There are things we can't change. And, and so you're going to think twice before you invite me back on your program. But, but you can't invite me back and they get upset that I talk too much because that's who I am. I'm a scorpion. And so we all need to deal with a scorpion. We can decide which scorpions we, need to, we want to keep in our lives. We can decide what our interaction will be. Maybe we have less interaction. Maybe it's better if you make the automatic things. And here's the other point I wanted to make. Uh -huh. Studies show, number one, the more involved fathers are with their children's lives, the more reliably they pay support, the more happily they pay the support, yeah. the more the more they help mom out and they take the, they'll help mom if mom ever needs a babysitter. Right. And the less likely they are to come back to court and challenge it. And right. so I tell people, if a court will give you a thousand dollars or we can get him to agree to give you a thousand dollars, I would much rather he agrees it on the gracious fine, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Because that means he'll be happy. Every month he writes the check, he'll be happy to do so. He won't come back into court and challenge it. You won't have to sue him for it. You won't have to send the police to go after him for, to collect the money because he feels like he, he's a big, important person doing it. So when people do things voluntarily, they feel better about it. And so the same result, and that's what the same result, if we can get the other, and, and then if you play the game right, if you're strategic about it, you, can, you might even be able to get more in a negotiation than you do when you're litigating. So I believe in mediation. I believe in using what we call ADR, alternative dispute resolution, or any resolution process. And my favorite one is collaborative law because we have two lawyers. So the big, in 30 seconds, it, let's say I'm representing you and that lawyer is representing your spouse and I establish a rapport with your spouse and that lawyer represent, establishes a rapport with you. And the most striking feature of collaborative law is that both lawyers and both clients sign an agreement that if either party leaves the negotiating table and goes to an adversarial process like litigation, both lawyers have to withdraw. It's a little bit controversial, but it gives you the safety to know that everybody around the table is committed to working this out. Right. On the other hand, you have to make sure that you feel comfortable enough that your spouse isn't playing you and trying to run you, run out the clock and run you down, and then your spouse is going to go to litigation. You've got to get rid of your lawyer and start all over. So, so you want to be a bit strategic. You, you want to do the right thing, but I like, like when I, I, I coach my clients, is when you get on the stand, you always have to tell the truth, but the truth doesn't mean the stupid truth. The truth can mean the smart truth, sort of know when to offer more and know when to just give you know, the simple answer. And know how to say it. And when you get a chance, when they give you a softball, you can hit it out of the park, hit it out of the park. So it, 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 I believe in, in, in collaborative law. I believe in mediation. But I also see the shortcomings of each. The big shortcoming of mediation is that as a process, if one side is completely inflexible and the other one is trying to be reasonable, mediation as a process takes from the reasonable and gives to the, to the inflexible. Right. We get to the first issue. He says, well, the more. and she goes, well, I guess I can, I can compromise. So she compromised. We get to the second issue. My husband goes, blah, 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 blah. and she goes, well, I guess I can compromise. And so we just keep doing that. Right. So, so if you're going to mediation, you need to know, okay, what's reasonable? When am I giving up too much? And I would suggest that most people who don't negotiate for a living, who don't know what the law is, who don't know what they're entitled to, when they get into that situation, they don't know, what do I want to say? I'll liken it to somebody going into the criminal court. They're charged with the thing. And the prosecutor says, fine, I'll offer you this. How do you know if that's a good deal? If you don't have a good, smart lawyer who knows the law, who knows what they can get, advising you and saying, that's a good deal, take it. Or I can do better, don't, don't take the deal. So you need trusted advisors. Right. And you need to have, I, I love the process. Have a, a, a good lawyer at your side that'll guide you, that'll teach you, that'll give you the information you make so that you make the decision that's right for you. And then mediation is wonderful. Mm. Yeah, I guess but then that's a key, right? Because you have so many attorneys. How do you know? The, I mean, I know you already give some of the hints of what a good lawyer looks like, but I'm coming into this, I'm clueless. <laughs> I'm interviewing attorneys. Like, like how do, what, what, what should I look for, right? For that smart lawyer. 
as, as most people do. It's, that's a very difficult question to answer. And I recently wrote a blog post. You know how some people write the, the article, how to, how to pick a divorce lawyer, or the difference between a good lawyer and a, sh a lousy lawyer. That doesn't interest me. I, I want to write the difference between a good lawyer and a great lawyer. So a lousy lawyer takes your case to court and loses. A good lawyer takes your case to court and wins. Great lawyer convinces the other side to settle with you so it never goes to the judge. Okay, so I have I have this article on my on my website on the blog. And my website is www.thenewyorkdivorcelawyer.com. That's all spelled out: T H E N E W. The New York Divorce Lawyers .com. And I have their good versus great, like how to tell. The most important quality for a lawyer is that he cares about you. That he cares about an individual, but you're not going to be able to tell. Right. You, you, so, I, I love it when people come in. Every once in a while, somebody will pull out at, at my initial strategy session. They'll they'll pull out the checklist, either either physically pull it out or proverbially pull it out. And they'll, are you involved in bar associations? And I I laugh inwardly mm -hmm. because. I can give you the answer, but you won't know how to assess the answer. There are right. people who are involved in bar associations that don't know what they're doing. Right. And there are people involved in bar associations that are the leaders mm -hmm. of their field. Mm -hmm. So I am now chairing the custody committee of the American Bar Association Family Law Section. But that doesn't automatically mean that I know what I'm doing. I, I'm very proud of it. I'm on the executive committee of the New York State Bar Family Law Section and the, and the American Bar Family Law Section. Mm -hmm. But that's not automatic. It, it, I, I think that those are, I'm very proud that, that I have that recognition from people that they, they know I bring value to the table. But somebody can have that, it's not automatic. And so to be a good lawyer, you need to know the law, you need to know the facts, you need to be committed to your clients, you need to be smart, efficient, intelligent, you need to have integrity, you need to know, you need to be able to present the story, so you need to be a raconteur, mm. right? And, 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 and if somebody's missing a piece of this, but, but if you, you had to say once the Missoula, Missoula Bar Association study, I think Missoula, Missouri, uh, did, they said the most important thing is the dedication of the lawyer to the client. Okay. So you walk into a lawyer and he's taking other phone calls and he's answering texts as you're talking. That's a problem. Yeah, they don't hear you. Yeah, yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. And, and I, I would argue the biggest problem clients have or men, somebody called me up about what's the biggest problem men have when they go through a divorce is that their lawyers don't That's hear them. Yeah. And if my lawyer doesn't know what my real argument is, how will the judge ever know what my real argument is? Yeah. So... The, you need a lawyer who cares about you, who understands the justice of your case, who can then present the argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need integrity, honesty, integrity. You need to be able to present it and dedication to the client. But I would start with a caring. Do you feel, do you feel the simpatico? What is the single greatest determinative factor on whether therapy will be successful or not? Your best friend is going to a therapist. What's the one question you've been asked that you will know with, let's say, 85% certainty whether therapy will be successful? That's an interesting question. <laughs> I so, guess I've been as a therapist, and you have to listen, like really hear the client, right? Yeah. So most people answer that question and say, if the patient wants to change. That's, that's the answer I get a lot, and that's a great answer. But that's not quite the right answer. The right answer is the amount of empathy from the therapist to the patient. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you know it, they gave the doctors, a, a the therapists, a, a, a dial, and they gave the patients a dial, and they said, we want you to dial in at every minute how much empathy you're getting from the... And wouldn't you know it, every person knew at every moment in time, spot on, what empathy they're getting. In short, we don't take advice from somebody who doesn't care about us. Mm. And, and so I'm arguing that the care, the dedication, the devotion mm -hmm. is, is something that you, you feel it, but it's not, again, it's not arithmetic. You can't, you can't do a checklist. Right. You just have to go in and feel and sense and know. Right. People tell me I'm different. People tell me I've changed their lives because I use all of these techniques. Right. Some people tell me I sound more like a therapist than, 
I did. I did. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> and, I can see that. Yeah. And I, I, I just did an initial strategy session with somebody, and she said she's been to a bunch of other lawyers, mm -hmm. and they were all higher priced lawyers than I am. Mm -hmm. And they were all like, okay, how do we fit the numbers in the boxes? Where are the boxes? What are we doing? The numbers in the box. I was the first person to sit down and sort of understand what she's going through mm -hmm. and strategize on how we create okay here's where we want to end up how do we set up our chessboard pieces so that we get you where you want to be mm -hmm. okay right but you have to be able to hear the client first and then what their needs are and then yeah okay but that's not a question mm -hmm. if you're patient if your client if you are one of our listeners Mm -hmm. Okay, so what question do I ask? Say, do you listen to to your client? Do you have empathy? Mm -hmm. Do you think strategically about your client's case? Everybody will say yes, and everybody believes that they do that because mm -hmm. everybody does to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. And a person, you know what they say: if all you have is a hammer, everything you see is looks like a nail. Right. And, and so, you need to have these skills to be able to use them. Right. right. And so, the job of a client is to evaluate the lawyer and say okay do they have the skills and it's very difficult i don't i don't envy them i i've been in positions before i had these skills where you're trying to figure out where you go into car mechanic and you don't know do they know what they're doing or not is this is it, and how do you tell them and, and unless you get in and do it and, and there are some unknowns yeah. and so somebody comes in how long will it take well i can't tell you it's like looking for a needle in a haystack until I find it, I don't know how, it, how long it will take. At the moment I find it, it won't take anything at all. And so it, there, there's a certain unknowable quality, an ineffable quality. Mm -hmm. And I, I would suggest that you, you, you take stock, sort of Daniel Goldman's book, Emotional Intelligence, and, mm -hmm. and how do you feel when you speak to the person? Do you get the sense? Right. It, it, I, I would like it. I, I don't know if this still applies nowadays. It, back in my day, when I was a kid, when you slammed the car door shut, you felt it. It, was, it slammed solidly. And then there's another thing. You slam it shut, and it feels like it's not. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like a thin piece of aluminum foil. And, and if, if you sneeze on the car, you've dented the door, right? Yeah. And so it, uh, I'm suggesting that you use those skills to determine. You can't give a lawyer a questionnaire. You can't test them. Yeah, it, because yeah. you don't have, you, you have to go to law school. I told you the story of this woman who thought they could, they could handle their case. It took, it took the woman three months to realize that she's spending more time, more money, and she's taking herself away from the place I told her last night. You're better off doing the thing you do best to make as much money as you can make and leaving the law to somebody who does that this profession because if you're going to learn everything you need to know to be able to do it yourself then you may as well do it for other people yeah go to law school right yeah exactly That's yeah. Awesome. and i'm happy to help if if one of our listeners wants to go to law school wants to know what's the best advice for somebody going to law school the answer is become a good writer because so much of your mark yeah. depends on how good a writer you are yeah. Yeah. and of course it's a longer discussion but that's yeah. a quick version yeah. so that's for all our our budding lawyers who are listening to the program. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you said a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, so I know we're way over time, but you know, last, uh, last thoughts, last few words you wanna leave listeners with? I will say it gets better. Okay. Just for all the people listening, don't do anything that you're going to cringe about over the next 30 years. So many times I find people, and even religious people, mm -hmm. and you come later and you go, you did what? You accused your spouse of molesting, like you did what? Yeah. And they're like, well, my lawyer told me to do that. Like, no, but where? But you know that's wrong. You know that's not integrity. So you're going through a bad period of time. There are people, see Kiri, see others that will give you the support that'll help you lift your spirits, that will help you navigate through the shoals of the dark times you're going through. It will get better, but make sure you don't lose your integrity on the way. Don't make sure that you don't destroy the things you love because you're scared. Find somebody that will protect you and defend you and take you through the process 
and don't destroy the things you love in your effort to try to protect the things you love. Yeah. Let's yeah. make sure the children can always look at you proudly, that there won't be anything that they will point to and say, you did that and you cringe every time you think about that. I heard a, a lecture yesterday from somebody who said, you know, Fran, Frank Abagnale, who did the Catch Me If You Can, Oh, and he said he did something. So he was a teenager when he when he did the, the the airline thing, and he got caught. And he said he was offered pardons from three United States presidents, and he didn't take them because he knew a pardon doesn't erase what he did. Mm. That he would have to do the deeds to counteract the bad side. He's now been working for forty years for the FBI, helping people and and fighting fraud. And it's this idea that sometimes we do something. Mm -hmm. And we can never live it down, and it haunts us forever. Right. Don't, let's not lose our humanity. You're, you're upset. You're angry. I understand that. Let's figure out how to get you over the upsetness, over the anger. Let's figure out how to get you what you deserve, what you need, so that you move forward in the happier place. But mm -hmm. let's not do that by destroying your integrity, destroying the loved ones, destroying your children's childhood, destroying mm -hmm. their future, destroying the possibility of having a good, cordial relationship with your ex or next so there are certain things that once they're done they change the relationship right. and it can never be undone so yeah, i i know that right now probably a listener won't think oh i want my ex to be at my thanksgiving table but, right. but i would say let's not do anything that makes it impossible maybe maybe in ten, five years from now ten years from now when your children are 18 years old and they've got girlfriends and they they're they're doing thanksgiving eve at the girlfriend's yeah. parents yeah. and they, they only have one or thanksgiving or christmas eve and christmas dinner and they have one meal to give and they don't want to have to worry about dad and mom wouldn't it be nice be, let's think about your child walking down the aisle on their wedding day yeah. and you and your ex can't no i'm not going to walk my child if, if, if my ex is there yeah. and you're going, really yeah. we're still fighting that fight 15 years later and that's because somebody's done something that was so unforgivable right. that the other party can't go over it. So I'm arguing about for, for forgiveness, for tolerance. Not, I'm not saying tolerate, stay in the relationship. Mm -hmm. If you, you've made the decision, if, you, you, if you've made the decision that this relationship can never bring you joy and love and, and make you walk on clouds, we, we're each entitled to that. But I can leave my spouse without being angry. I can leave my spouse without destroying my children. Right. And use skilled practitioners, Kiri, me, others, that will help you get through this without making it worse. Let's not further traumatize the relationship. Let's see if we can salvage something and start to build the seeds of trust that are going forward. We may never be best friends, right. but we can be cordial to each other when the children are involved. When the children graduate elementary school, high school, graduate college, we can both be there at the same time without pulling out the knives. Yeah. And that is a great gift that we should all want to give our children. That is so true. Yeah, very well said. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. I mean, you have so much knowledge and so much wisdom. So yeah, that was, that was amazing. Thank you so much. It's always great to talk to you, Kiri. Yes. And I know that you share a lot of this and that you help people going through this. And so I, I, I'm always gratified to meet others who are on this path of peace. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah.